This week we are going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, if you want to turn there. And I'll be reading a few other passages as we go along, and I may be going through them quickly, uh, but please let me know afterward if there are any of these that I, that I read from that, that you're not able to catch, and I'll be glad to, to get them for you. But Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and these a few verses are commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Several years ago, probably two or three years ago, I was thinking about, about praying and I was thinking about the Lord's Prayer. And I thought to myself, why don't I pray the Lord's Prayer more than I do? And I couldn't come up with a good answer to why I didn't. And so I started praying the Lord's Prayer more frequently in my life. Now, maybe you guys pray it often or maybe you do not. But I'm going to tell you what, it's about as good a prayer as you ever going to pray. I don't think you can do any better than what Jesus said when Jesus said, here's how you need to pray. And so if Jesus says this is how you need to do anything, then it's the best way to do it. And so I began to pray uh, the Lord's Prayer more frequently in my life. And here recently I've been asking myself the question, why don't we pray more with the Lord's Prayer in church? And guess what the answer I come up with? Well, I don't know why. I don't know that there's a good reason why we don't pray the Lord's Prayer more in church. And so, Lord willing, we may pray the Lord's Prayer more in church. There's not much we can improve upon praying than what Jesus tells us here as we look at the Lord's Prayer. Now, just the words of this prayer in and of themselves are perfect. We, we could argue they're perfect because Jesus told, them to, told us to pray these words, but, but they're also a good... They're also a good frame or a good structure or a good skeleton that, that even in each of these categories or areas of the Lord's Prayer, you know, we could expound on some of these things if we wanted to and, and name more specific things that are going on in our life or they're in our heart. But if we follow this guide, either saying the exact words or just, just saying each part and saying, okay, how does this apply to other things in my life and applying this prayer in areas of our life, it is a good prayer for us to look at. If anybody ever tells you, or maybe you are somebody that says, I don't know how to pray. Well, you need not look any further than Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Now, you can also look in Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. It's a, it's a, much, a, a much more condensed version of this, but... The language is pretty similar for the most part. The, the events that, that occur before the Luke uh, account and Matthew's account are slightly different, but, but the prayer is, is, is essentially the same, barring the, the ending, uh, but it's a much more condensed version of the Lord's Prayer. And so that's what we're going to look at today for a few minutes is Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and then we will talk about these verses. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Father God, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for these good words, and I thank you for this prayer that Jesus taught us, and I pray that we would, we would learn from it, that we would, we would let it speak to our life, God, that we'd let it guide us in, in how we need to pray, and I pray that you just would help us to be focused on you this morning, help me to do a good job as I try to preach and teach your word, and let it be for your glory, and just hide me behind the cross, and help me to know just what to say, and I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. What I have discovered through the years of, of reciting the Lord's Prayer or being in, in situations where the Lord's Prayer is recited is it almost seems as though a lot of times we kind of have a mixture of various translations, words that are in one translation that are not in another translation, and, and oftentimes we kind of mix and match, and that's fine. We, we, we usually say it maybe how we learned it, maybe how we read, or a lot of times, at least back when I was a kid, and even now I see it sometimes, Kids at Little League ball games, maybe before or after a game, the team gets together and recites the Lord's Prayer. Now, I don't know how common that is these days, but I know several years ago I was umpiring softball. Now, how I got that job, I don't know. But, but I remember that some of the teams after a game, they would get together and they would say the Lord's Prayer. And so at least up to a few years ago, that was a thing, and I imagine that was a thing now. Now, this doesn't really relate to the sermon, but I was curious, you know, when we say uh, 
God, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. Now, maybe some of you have heard that term trespass before, or maybe you recite it, or maybe you don't. Maybe you say debts, or maybe you say sins. But as I was looking through, I, I remember hearing that, and I even remember saying that times and, and, and repeating the Lord's Prayer. And I, I noticed, and I said, well, what translation uses the word trespasses? I've, I've heard it. I've heard other people say it. And so I got to looking, and I said, well, it's got to be the King James. Well, it wasn't the King James, and I looked at the New King James, and I ended up looking at 46 different translations, and I only found one translation that uses the word trespasses, and that was a translation from, I think, 1526. And so for whatever reason, trespasses has made its way through the years, and sometimes we may say, uh, God, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me, but... Uh, that was an interesting thing, I thought, how we sometimes maybe uh, mix and choose different words as we are quoting the Lord's Prayer. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus says here, And this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, this is a little different than Luke's account, because at the beginning of Luke's account, in Luke chapter 11... One of the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. Now, maybe that's a thought that's come into our mind, or maybe that's something that we've really asked God before. God, help me to pray better. God, help me to know how to pray. And in Luke's account, it is, it is this request by his disciples, which is what leads Jesus to say, okay, if you want to learn how to pray, this is the manner in which you should pray. Now, in Matthew's account, in context of the verses before, he's, he's really teaching the disciples how not to pray. Look, there are some who want to pray for show. There are some who may be hypocrites when they pray. There are some who, who when they pray, they don't really pray from their heart. But, but you don't need to pray like that. You don't need to be one who prays for show. You don't need to be one who just says long prayers just so people will think you can pray better. But instead, Jesus says, pray this way. Now, it's, it's weird how that is, right? We, we, may, we may think, man, I, I'm not a good prayer because I can't pray as long as other people. But if you read this Lord's Prayer, it's not very long. It doesn't take you but a few seconds to recite this prayer. As with anything that we see in Scripture, God does not look at what's on the outside. He doesn't care about how long or how short our prayer life is. He looks at our heart, and that's true with everything in our life. And so we get, we get consumed and sometimes maybe worry too much about the outward appearance, uh, what people may see or what people may hear. But what God really cares about is what's in our heart, and we need to remember that in our prayer life. I don't I don't think that there are ever any wrong words that we can say in a prayer as long as they come from our heart. You say any words you want to say. You say ten words or you say a thousand words. It doesn't matter if it comes from your heart and praise the Lord. You, you are praying a good prayer. And Jesus tells us the best prayer to pray here. And he starts out by saying, Our Father. Now when we go before the Lord and pray, we need to remember that he is our Father. And he is a good father. That's a, that's a tough thing maybe for some to wrap their head around because the truth of the matter is it's not every father that we see in this world is a good father. There are bad fathers in this world. Now, if you've had a good father, praise the Lord that you had a good example. But if you had a bad father, don't, don't, don't attribute the bad things that our earthly fathers do don't, don't apply those characteristics to God. Even if we see bad fathers, that is not the father that God is. God is good in every way. God is a father who provides for his children. God provided for us in the best way by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have 
everlasting life. God is good to us. God provides for us. God guides us. God leads us. God tries to help us get through life. God is a good father. But sometimes even good fathers have to give their children choice. Now you bring up a child in the way they should go and hopefully when they are old they will not depart from it as the scripture says. Uh, but oftentimes, even when a child is brought up in the way they should go, there may be a year or two or a period where they make the wrong choice. Not so different from the Bible story of the prodigal son, a father who had a couple of sons, and one of his sons, as he uh, was, was getting older, decided he wanted to do things his way, and he struck out on his own and quickly realized that it was better at the father's house and he returned to the father and that's the story i believe of many children who grew up with good fathers and good christian homes and knew god's word they make the choice to live for the world for a little while and eventually realize that was the wrong choice now god is our father he is a good father and he guides us and teaches us and tells us all we need to know in his words but he also gives us choice. He doesn't force us to follow him and trust him and, and, and be his child. But, man, if we know the truth of his word, how often are we like the prodigal son that returns and says, God, I have been with you and I've been without you. And I realize that it's better to be with you than to be apart from you. And as a good father, God welcomes us home. As a good father, God is proud when we come to him and say, Father, forgive me because I have sinned against you, but I know that I need you. Our Father is how this starts, and we need to remember that God is a good Father who has provided for us and who is there for us and wants us to come to Him. And when we pray, that's just what we do. We come to God, and He wants us to come to Him and to ask Him for things and to tell him that we need him and to say, God, forgive me. That's what God wants. He's a good father and he is there for you. If you don't pray to him, pray to him. And this is a good way to start your prayer, our father. Which art in heaven. Now, where does God reside? Well, God resides in heaven. And oftentimes we think of heaven as being up and hell as being down. Uh, but heaven is a spiritual place. And, and God is not here on this earth with us in, in that sense and that he's sitting in his room on a pew like we are. God is in heaven. Uh, we see in Psalms chapter 11 verse 4 it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes watch. He examines every one. Now when we think about God being in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, we use that language that God is above, and that's appropriate language and, and good for us to think about God in that way. God is above all. He is not here in the mess of all of this sin. He is not overtaken by the worries and the troubles of this world, but he is above all things. And that's why when we go to God, we can have confidence and we can have hope because we are praying to a Father who is above all things. He is above everything in this world. He has overcome everything in this world through Jesus Christ. And when we pray to God, we need to remember that God is above all, that he is all-powerful, our Father which art in heaven. Not only is he above all and that he is over and victorious over all things, but he is also above all in that he looks down and is able to see all things. Perhaps you uh, have seen fire towers around, really tall. They were good because you can walk up into these fire towers. And, and what is the advantage of a fire tower? You're above all things, which means you can look down and you can see everything, things that you couldn't see at ground level. If you're at ground level and there's a fire a half a mile away, well, you may not see it. But if you get up above all things, you can look down and you see all things that are going on. And we think about our Father, which art in heaven. Not only is he above all things and that he is victorious over all things, but also he is above all things and he sees all things. There is nothing that is hidden from God. And we need to remember that. That when we pray to our Father, which art in heaven, 
He knows everything that we do. He knows everything that we say. He knows everything that's been on our mind. He knows everything that's been on our heart. And so let's just confess it to him. Let's just tell him. He knows that we are evil, rotten people who sometimes uh, lose, uh, lose their anger and have a bad attitude and say and do things that they shouldn't say and do and think things that we shouldn't think. And when temptations come, we may dwell on those or give on those temptations more than we should. God knows all those things. And the best thing we can do is just be honest before God. Just humble ourselves and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, God, I know you are a good God. God, I am coming to you because I need you. God, I know that you are above all things. God, I know that you are all powerful. And God, I know that you know my heart, and I just want to pour my heart out to you and say, God, I need you because my heart is wretched. That's something we need to know, too. Our hearts are pretty wretched. We... We might lie to ourselves and tell ourselves we're not that bad, but the truth is we are that bad. And we need to be honest and we need to humble ourselves before our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Some of your translations may say something about God's name is holy or God's holy name is to be honored. That's what hallowed means. That's not a word that we really say too much in our world today but when we talk about God's name being hallowed we are saying that God's name is holy it is set apart it's to be higher and better it is different than all other names he is God and God alone he is worthy of our honor he is worthy of our praise Revelation chapter 15 verse 4 says Lord who will not fear and glorify your name because you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, because your righteous acts have been revealed. Here we see the acknowledgement of what Jesus says in this Lord's Prayer. We see that John using that same language here as he wrote the book of Revelation. You alone are holy. When we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, or holy is your name, who is holy apart from God? He alone is holy. He alone is to be honored. And we need to remember that, that when we pray to God, that we try not to be too flippant in our prayers, but we remember that we are praying to the one and only holy God, a God who has loved us, a God who has been gracious to us, a God who has been merciful to us, a God who is patient with us, a God who provides for us. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is holy and we need to remember that when we pray to God. We need to honor him and be reverent to him when we pray to God. Thy kingdom come. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it says, The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Thy kingdom come. Now, we know when Jesus came onto the scene, we remember this from Mark maybe when we first started it, that Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Now, Jesus is our entrance into the kingdom. When, when Jesus comes near and we follow Jesus, we become part of the kingdom of God because Jesus is the king. And wherever the king, the king is, there is his kingdom. And when we follow Jesus Christ, we are part of the kingdom of God. But we are looking for God's kingdom maybe in a more fuller sense. God's kingdom has come in Jesus Christ, but we are looking for God's kingdom to fully come. That the kingdom of God will also be the kingdom of this earth. And we see in Scripture that it says one day God will make a new heavens and a new earth. And that's going to be God's kingdom at its best. That's the kingdom that we look forward to. When we follow Jesus Christ, we are part of the kingdom of God, but we still live in this old world. But one day God's going to transform this old world. 
And we will be part of God's kingdom and the way that God intends and what God wants and that we are free from all the mess and all the things of this world. So we pray to God, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, is that not what we should want? Is God's will to be done in this world? That's a tough one, though. That's a tough one to pray. Because in our minds, knowing that God is good we may have a hard time wrapping our head around the fact that bad things occur. And we cannot deny that they do. We cannot deny that bad things occur all over our world. We cannot deny that bad things happen to good people. But when we pray, we must pray that God's will be done. And sometimes God's will may mean that things that we don't understand occur. It's hard for us to imagine when someone is sick how that could be God's will when they are suffering greatly with illness. How could that be God's will? Well, it's hard to know. But oftentimes maybe we fail to realize that when we are sick or when we are at our weakest moments, that is when we call out to God the most. That is when we seek God the most. Even sometimes people who are very sick and suffering may even be so bold as to say that. It may catch us off guard when they say, oh, no, I'm not angry at God. I've drawn closer to God in this than ever before. And so in some instances, we see things that are very bad and sicknesses and things that go on in this world. But sometimes God even uses those bad things to draw people closer to him. If someone who is sick and begins to seek the Lord when they never have and humble themselves before the Lord and put their faith in Jesus Christ and gain eternal life through that, through a sickness, well, that's a good thing. That's God's will being done through something that is bad. That is something good comes from something bad. That a soul may be saved. And what if another family member is able to see their suffering family member and say, man, how are you getting through this? And and that sick family member says, let me tell you how I'm getting through it. I'm getting through it through Jesus. And the family begins to see that faith, and they begin to see Jesus. And so that's just one example of something bad that we have all experienced because we've all had people that were sick and that were suffering, and we say, man, how could God allow this to happen? Well, it may be that God allowing that to happen saves their soul. And if that's the case, then we could also ask the question, how could God not allow this to happen? And so sometimes God knows that even bad things lead to the good for his kingdom. And so we must pray, God, your will be done, even when it's difficult. Because sometimes God's will does not line up with our will. Because we think as human beings and in human ways, and we think everything needs to always go good all the time. But sometimes the bad has to occur for the good to occur. We talked about that here a few months ago with the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, hated by his brothers, sold into slavery and prison, but ended up second in command in the land of Egypt. And God was, was, had mercy on Joseph throughout it all. And the people uh, knew that, that, that Joseph was a godly man through it all. And because of all of that bad that happened, Joseph was in a place where he could save his family and save the nation of Israel as it was just beginning. It was in my opinion, maybe the best example in Scripture of, of something bad. Well, second best of something bad happening for something good. The best example, no doubt, being Jesus Christ's death on a cross. What a horrible thing that one would have to suffer such a death. But it was for the good, for the forgiveness of sins. And so sometimes when we pray for God's will, it does not result in what we would consider good. But it always results in what God needs to happen for his kingdom to grow and for his will to be done. Even Jesus, before he went to the cross, said, God, let this cup pass from me, but not my will be done. Thy will be done. And we need to remember that when we pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You give us this day our daily bread. 
Now, it's good to know that we have a God who will provide for us. He will give us the things that we need, and we are reminded of that on a few occasions in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 7, just a little, little ways down from what we're reading today, verse 9, it says, What man among you, if his son ask him for bread, will give him a stone? And Jesus goes on to say, Look, if you who are sinful people know how to provide for your children, how much more so does God know how to provide and will provide for he is? Any good father, if their child says, I'm hungry, they're not going to give them a rock. They're going to give them something to eat. They're going to give them what they need. And so when we pray to God and say, give us this day our daily bread, we need to know that God will provide for us. And Jesus speaks similarly in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. He says, and this is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't, the life, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? That's a good verse right there. Is God going to take care of us? Absolutely. Now, oftentimes... We may, we may get off track with that. We may think, okay, well, I want this, 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 and this, and i got to have it, and if I don't get it, then God's not taking care of me. Well, a lot of times we get our wants and our needs mixed up. We are blessed in these United States of America, I'm going to tell you what. We're sitting in here with air conditioning today. We, we, we better than most people in the world, I would venture to say, just because we got air conditioning. we got clothes, and chances are we probably all going to eat something after church. If you ain't got something to eat, let me know and we'll get you something. But chances are we probably are all going to have something to eat. Now, we may not always have what we want to eat or what we want to wear, or our air conditioner may not always work, but that doesn't mean that God is not providing for us. Just uh, yesterday I went to the Piggly Wiggly, and I wanted some extra cheesy Cheez-Its, and they had one box, and, well, I had to get it, but I couldn't eat them because they were for somebody else, and I didn't have a box for me. But does that mean that God hadn't provided because I didn't get my extra cheesy Cheez-Its? No. You know what You know what I had to do? This is horrible. Y'all are going to feel sorry for me. I had to eat regular Cheez-Its. <laughs> now, that's the kind of suffering that we have to do, right? I mean, if we're honest, we usually don't have to suffer much. I mean, the extent of my suffering this week have been regular cheeses instead of extra cheesy. But God provides what we need, even if it's not always what we want. And that does not mean that times will not be hard. That will not mean that we will always have an abundance of all of our favorite things. But we can rest assured that God will be with us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And God is faithful to give us our daily bread. And as Jesus says in Matthew 6, all the other things we need as well. And forgive us our debts. Now, it's almost certain here that Jesus is speaking of, of sins. We, uh, we don't owe God anything. Not that we could pay him anything if we did, for the wages of sin is death. That's the only thing we can pay for what we do and how we live and our sinfulness is we give our life. But praise the Lord, Jesus gave his life for us. He paid the death penalty for us. Forgive us our debts or forgive us our sins. Now, this is something that we need to make sure that we pray that God do for us. Now, maybe there are some specifics you can remember. If you remember when you're praying, hey, God, I did this thing today. I shouldn't have done it. I pray that you forgive me for that. And I don't want to be that way. I don't want to do that. Help me not to do that anymore. We need to ask God to forgive us when we pray. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 it says if we confess our sins he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so when we pray to our father which art in heaven and we ask him to forgive us of our sins you can rest assured that your sins have been forgiven how can you know it because you ask him if you ask him with a true repentant heart 
then God is faithful to forgive us of our sins. Now, we, we need that because we are sinners. And we like to be forgiven. And we praise God that we can be forgiven. Not be, because if we're honest and we read the Bible and we know that we have not done anything to deserve this forgiveness. So it's pretty bold. We have to come pretty boldly before God in the throne of God and say, Okay, God, I've done it again. I've sinned again. But God, I ask you to forgive me because... Your word tells me to come to you. Your word tells me that you will forgive me. So God, I come to you, I confess my sin, and I ask you to forgive me. That's the easy part. It's this next part that's not quite so easy. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, again, we could take this literally. Maybe there are occasions where people are indebted to you monetarily and you forgive those debts. If God leads you to do so, praise the Lord. But he's speaking of sin here. God, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. That's the tough part, right? We all about being forgiven. We all want to be forgiven. But we don't always want to forgive. Now, if we are unwilling to forgive people who have done us wrong, then it may very well be that we ourselves have not been forgiven. Because if you've received the grace of God, and you have been forgiven, and you know just how wretched you are, you know just what you've received... Being a child of God, you should want to extend the grace of God to others. If you are determined that so-and-so has done something so wrong to you that you will never forgive them, and you claim to be a Christian and to receive the grace and forgiveness of God, well, you better check your life. Because if you are unwilling to forgive, it may very well mean that you have not truly experienced forgiveness, that you have not realized just how evil and wicked you really are and how great it is that God has given you mercy. So we ask God to forgive us, praise the Lord, He does, but because of that, we should also forgive others. What if we're not willing to forgive others? Well, we're in bad shape. It says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. All right, that's good. But this next part is tough. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. Now that's a pretty straightforward passage right there. Kind of shuck it, shuck it down right there. It's pretty simple. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we need to remember the truth of that verse. God has forgiven us, and we need to forgive others. Now that may not be easy to do. I'm not telling you it's easy to do. But if you are really a child of God and has, have experienced the grace of God, then even if it's hard to forgive people, you will want to. You will have the desire to. You may even say, I hadn't done it yet, but God, I know I need to. God, help me to do it. God, I want to do it, but I'm struggling with doing it. So God, help me to forgive them as you have forgiven me. And that's great for us to have. Praise the Lord. Jesus put that in there for us. We need to, one... Be forgiven, know we are forgiven, and forgive others. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. This is a, kind of a difficult verse at first glance because we think, wait a minute, does God lead us into temptation well it's pretty clear in scripture that god does not lead us into temptation uh it says so in james chapter 1 verse 13 it says no one going undergoing a trial should say i'm being tempted by god for god is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone so we know that god does not tempt us but god does sometimes allow us to be tempted. We see that in the story of Job. That's probably the best example. Job, a righteous man, a man of integrity. And Satan wants to try to get Job to turn from God. And so 
boy, God allows Satan to do all these things to Job, and Job, he stands firm in the Lord. And at the end of it all, of all that Job went through, and all that he lost, he draws closer to God at the end, I believe we can say. He trusts God. He humbles himself before God, and God blesses him with more than he had before. So there are times in, in life where God may allow us to be tempted. And here in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Help us when those temptations come because those temptations in our life may very well be like they were in Job's life. Uh, they may be an attempt by the enemy to get us to deny God and to turn on God, but uh, God may very well know that that won't be the result. Instead, we will seek him all the more. Perhaps a better way to understand maybe what Jesus meant in this passage is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. Perhaps that's what we need to think about when we pray, God, lead me not into temptation. We think about these words of Paul and say, Okay, God, you tell us in your word that you will not us allow us to be tempted more than what we can bear. So God, provide us that way. Help us to see that way of escape. Help us to overcome that temptation. How do we overcome temptation? Well, one good way to overcome temptation is by the very word of God. I might have said this last week, but I'm going to say it again. When Jesus started his ministry, he was in the wilderness getting ready for 40 days, and, and the devil came and tempted Jesus. But how did Jesus fight the devil? He used Scripture. He quoted Scripture. Now, the devil would misquote Scripture, trying to twist it around, but Jesus knew better than that. And the way that he was able to fight against the temptation of the devil was by the very Word of God. And so you and I can fight against the temptations of the devil, too, with the Word of God. You know, maybe you say, I don't know any other Word of God. Well, maybe you know the Lord's Prayer. Pray the Lord's Prayer, because right there in it, it says, And lead us not into temptation. And so when we are tempted, quote God's Word. Maybe you don't have your Bible around. Maybe you're not able to read it. Take God's Word, tuck it away in your heart, and call on it in your times of need and your times of sorrow, and your times of pain, and in your times of temptation, that God would deliver you from those times. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, we certainly need to be delivered from evil because there is much evil in our world today. There is evil around us all the time. We are always tempted to do things that are evil. There is always that temptation for evil to come into our heart. But deliver us from evil. That needs to be our prayer. God, I know there is evil around. I know I'm tempted to do evil. I know my heart sometimes dwells on evil. But God, I want to be delivered from that evil. In Psalm chapter 141, verse 4, it says, Do not let my heart turn to any evil thing or perform wicked acts with men who commit sin. Do not let me feast on their delicacies. That needs to be our prayer sometimes too. God, don't let my heart turn to any evil thing. Why do we have to say that? Because our hearts want to turn to evil things. We see things. We hear things. We are tempted to do what is evil. And sometimes what is evil looks good. But we need to pray that God would deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is God's kingdom that will reign supreme. It is God who is all-powerful. And it is God and his kingdom that will rule and reign forever. The question is, are you part of that kingdom? Have you found the power of God through Jesus Christ? Are you trusting him? Because I'm going to tell you, there's no other kingdom 
that you can be a part of that's going to be sustained for all of eternity. There is only one kingdom that will rule and reign forever, and that is the kingdom of God. And so when we pray, we need to remember. We need to ask ourselves that question, am I part of the kingdom? God, if I am part of the kingdom, then let me rest in your power and look forward to this kingdom and the day that it will reign and rule forever. But while I'm in this world, dear Lord, I'm going to call out to you. God, help me. God, provide for me. God, forgive me. God, help me to forgive others. And God, help me not to do what is evil. As we close today, let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you need to pray, well, that's a beautiful prayer to pray. Tuck that away in your heart. Remember those words and let Jesus and his words of prayer guide you in your prayer life. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for these good words. And God, I pray that you just would... Help us to remember this prayer in our life and all we do. And God, I pray that maybe there are some here today or maybe some listening online and they never, they never knew these words or they've never prayed them. They never realized the power. But God, I pray that you help us not to forget that you are our all-powerful Father and that we seek you and that we know you love us through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And I pray, God, that you would help us to live in that love and extend that love to others. God, help us to come to you with our sins, knowing that we will be forgiven. And God, help us to be able to forgive others. Help us in this evil world that we are in, dear Lord. We need you. We need help with the temptations. And I pray that through your power, you will deliver us from those temptations and from that evil. And God, we thank you for establishing your kingdom through Jesus Christ. And I pray that if there is one that does not know Jesus today, that they would repent of their sins. Seek that forgiveness you offer, and they will find it in Jesus Christ, knowing that he is our Savior, who gave his life on the cross and shed his blood so we could be forgiven. And God, you resurrected him, and he is all-powerful, and he is above all things. And God, I pray that he would be the Savior of our life. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.